In the first part of Unit 8, in the last two lessons, we looked at the growing sectionalism and the causes of the Civil War. Now in our next three lessons here, we're going to discuss the Civil War in itself, a war that lasted between the years 1861 and 1865. So our first lesson on the war is Lesson 37, North versus South. So in this one, our teaks that we can identify the Civil War, we can put events in order, we can explain why this is an important time in history, and then we can look at the importance of leaders like Abraham Lincoln, Jefferson Davis, and Robert E. Lee. We can look at major events of the war, we can locate Fort Sumter, and then we can analyze the leadership qualities of Abraham Lincoln during the war. Our focus for this lesson is going to be to look at the, the two sides and compare the uh, comparative resources between the Union and Confederate States in 1861, the year the war started, and look at their various advantages and disadvantages. If we look at this bar graph here with the Union States in blue, the Confederate States in this kind of yellow-orange color, you see that in most categories, especially in industrial production and even in agricultural production, that the Union had many more resources, in some cases vast numbers, compared to those of the Confederate States. The Confederates did have one important advantage, though. And if you look here, you see that the Confederate States, the Southern States, had a long tradition of military service. Uh, young men were tend to be raised in the South learning how to handle firearms, to hunt, and to shoot, and many of them did join the military. So they actually had a good number of people who had had military experience or at least knew how to handle a weapon, whereas that was a much smaller group in the North. And of course the South had a much greater cotton production because it was their main source of income. But in just about everywhere else, you see factory goods here. Again, uh, livestock, wheat, corn, animals, just about everything else the Union had a great advantage. Another important Union advantage was just simply their population. The Union had a large population of around 22 million people, whereas the Confederates had a smaller population of about 9 million, a third of which were slaves and were not going to be able to fight. So if we look here, at the beginning of the war, you see that the, uh, the North did had a, a, about a 2 to 1 advantage over soldiers, but as the war progresses, by the last year of the war, that advantage has increased to almost 4 to 1, and this is going to be very critical and very uh, you know, very important as the war progresses. Another advantage of the Union that's going to become very decisive and very important is the fact that the Union had a very good railroad system. They had been investing in railroads for a good uh, 40 years because of the more industrialized North. In fact, they had more cities and more factories, so they, they were developing and, and investing in railroad transportation. The South did have railroads, but railroads were not nearly as important, and they simply didn't put the kind of investment, and they didn't have the major cities connecting them as well. So this is going to be an important advantage to the Union as the war goes forward. The Confederacy did have a few advantages, though, and one of them was the fact that they, had to, they were going to be fighting a defensive war. In order to win this war, the North, the Union, was going to have to invade the South and force them to surrender. So this allowed the Union to fight a defensive war at home and to defend their homeland, which is very much the situation that we had back in the American Revolution, where the uh, Americans, the Patriots, were defending their homes, and it was up to the British to invade and conquer them. So in, in, we're going to also see in other ways uh, kind of parallels between the Confederates and the American Patriots and the Union and the British. But one big difference was the outcome. A Union a disadvantage, like we said, they had to a, a huge area. And just like the British back those 80 years before, they were invading an unfamiliar territory. They did not know the South the way the uh, Confederate soldiers did. Now one of the big pl complaints that the South had with the, uh, with the Union government, with the United States government, was that they felt that the federal government was too strong and imposed its will on the states. So that's going to become an advantage in the war for the North and that they have a strong central government. And that Abraham Lincoln, while he was very inexperienced and this was his first political office, uh, he proves to be a very strong and capable leader. On the other hand, in the Confederates, their president, Jefferson Davis, is not nearly as effective a leader. Actually, Jefferson Davis did not want to be a politician in the Confederacy. What he really wanted to do was to be commissioned as a general. But when he was convinced that he had to take the presidency, he tended to be a poor leader. He argued a lot with, the, uh, with other members of the government. And because they were not as strong as central government, more based on the states, it was harder to get the Confederate states to cooperate and work together. Now, while the Confederacy did not have very good political leadership, what they did have was excellent military commanders in the field, and they had probably America's best general at the time, General Robert E. Lee from Virginia. Prior to the war, 
General Lee had been an up-and-coming star in the United States Army. He had graduated very high in his class at West Point. He was considered a very, uh, a very gifted general and leader and a real gentleman. He was almost universally respected throughout the North and the South in the Army. The Union, on the other hand, had a series of unaggressive generals with very mixed results until finally General Grant took charge of the Army. They were men such as George McClellan, who would have some victories early in the war, but would be fired by Lincoln. Then we have Ambrose Burnside. He was a disaster. Then you had Joe Hooker. And General Meade, who would win the Battle of Gettysburg, but would ultimately be replaced by Lincoln for failing to pursue and capture the enemy. And just in general, the, the South just had a better military tradition, and some of the best generals and leaders, generals and colonels in the army, came from the South at this time. And that gave them a distinct advantage uh, at various times in the war. Now the strategies for victory. The Union's plan, which was very much, if you look at it, you're going to recognize it because it was much the British plan during the American Revolution. First of all, was to blockade southern ports, and that meant establishing a, a uh, navy blockade off the coast of the southern states on the Atlantic and in the Gulf of Mexico, much like the British did during the Revolution and the War of 1812. Some important ports for the South were, of course, Richmond, Charleston, Savannah, and probably one of the most important ones at the time, New Orleans, because it's at the mouth of the Mississippi River. And speaking of the Mississippi, the other plan was to capture control of the Mississippi River, because in doing so, they capture that big highway, right? And it also splits the South in two. It divides the western Confederate states, such as Texas and Arkansas and Louisiana, from the rest of the Confederacy. And finally, that they would squeeze in and capture the capital of Richmond, Virginia. And once they captured the capital, it would force the South to surrender. And in fact, General, General Winfield Scott had a name for this. He called this the Anaconda Plan. Now, an anaconda is a large snake in South America that uh, kills its prey not by biting it, but by wrapping around and squeezing it or constricting it to death. So the idea of the Anaconda Plan was to squeeze the South economically, to cut off the coast, to take the Mississippi River and to capture the capital so the South could not sell its cotton because they depended, depended on cotton sales in order to raise revenue to fund the, fund the war and fund the army. If they couldn't sell their cotton and get it out to markets, then they could not pay for the war and this would force them to surrender. So this was an economic plan to squeeze the South and force their surrender. Now, just like the Union's plans were similar to the British during the American Revolution, the Confederacy's plans were similar to what the uh, Patriot strategy was in the American Revolution. First of all, the idea is to stay home and fight a defensive war, to make the enemy come to them on their turf. They also believed that because of their superior fighting skill, that the North would quickly tire of fighting and would give up and accept a, truce or a peace treaty between the two and let them exist as a Confederacy. And also, just like the Americans during the Revolution, they were counting on European money and supplies. What they hoped was that Europe was so dependent upon their cotton that Europe would come to their aid in order to keep that cotton flowing from the South. That's what they hoped. That's not what happened. Now, we also see some technological inventions and advances during the war. One of these was a French invention called the mini ball. This was a new type of bullet that could be fired from a, a rifle with a grooved barrel. When the mini ball came out, it spun very fast, and the result was that the mini ball could travel much faster and much longer and more accurately. So this made individual soldiers much more deadly than they had been in previous wars. And the mini ball is going to be one of the main reasons why the casualties and the death count for the Civil War is so high. So it comes time to be, uh, for Lincoln to be inaugurated, and he gives his first inaugural address. Now, by the time Lincoln is inaugurated, six states have joined South Carolina in seceding from the Union, and eventually four more will join them to equal the total of 11 Confederate states. But in his inaugural address, Lincoln makes the case against secession, and he makes a legal argument here. He says that the Constitution is a contract between the states and that the South has no right to secede and that their secession is therefore illegal. He also promises that it is not his intent to invade the South or to abolish slavery. So even while he's saying secession is illegal, he's trying to make some peace overtures to them as well, saying he's not going to abolish slavery, he's going to follow the law, and he does not wish to invade. But he does not want slavery to expand to the West. And like we said, that was a critical issue for the South. 
One of the first things that southern states did when they uh, seceded from the Union was to seize federal property and especially federal forts within their state. So one of these federal forts was Fort Sumter off the coast of South Carolina, which defended the harbor entering Charleston. Uh, this was commanded by a Union major, Major Anderson, but he refused to surrender Fort Sumter to the Confederate forces. So, however, they were cut off from the uh, Union supplies. They were not able to get supplies to them. So time was ticking away, and ultimately they feel that they were going to be attacked. And sure enough, on April 12, 1861, a Confederate force under the command of General PGT Beauregard opened artillery fire on Fort Sumter, forcing them to surrender a, f a couple of days later. So we now have the official beginning of the Civil War. And a little bit of history's ironies, uh, General Beauregard and Anderson actually knew each other at West Point and they were friends. Anderson had been Beauregard's, get this, artillery instructor at West Point. So the Civil War has now officially begun with the firing on Fort Sumter again on April 12, 1861, the start of a four-year Civil War. So let's conclude with our Lesson 37 thoughts. How do you predict that the following advantages and disadvantages for each side are going to affect the course and the outcome of the Civil War? The fact that the North and the Union had greater industrial power and better political leadership versus the superior military tradition and leaders of the Confederacy and the fact that the Confederacy was fighting on its home turf. So we'll continue with our next lesson when the fighting begins and we'll see you then.